If a generation is 20 years long, September 11th, 2001 was a generation ago. None of my generation will ever forget 9-11. Some of my generation will never forgive 9-11. As a nation, we take great pride in the tens of thousands of acts of bravery, of valor, and national unity we witnessed on September 11, 2001 and in the days that followed, and properly so. But we rarely speak of the enemy and what 9-11 taught us about the nature of a determined enemy. I know that on 9-11, some of my generation relearned a lesson that we could have learned and should have learned from my father's generation in World War II and my grandfather's generation in World War I. Because there is an important lesson there. Only a few of my generation will even speak of that lesson. It is uncomfortable to contemplate, uncomfortable to articulate, but dangerous to ignore. We know through experience that very few people of any generation will care to hear or care to learn in times of peace what their fathers learned in times of war. But I will offer this. The lesson my generation could have learned from my father's generation and from my grandfather's generation is this. You have enemies. Every nation in history has had enemies. It is likely that trend will continue. You may not know your enemy, and the only sure way to discover your enemy is by their deeds. You are no more than a symbol to your enemies, a citizen of the United States. You have no value to your enemies as an individual. None. Your enemy does not see you as a fellow human or an individual with hopes and dreams and family and friends. You're only seen by your enemy as an enemy. And history shows, and our fathers and grandfathers learned, and we relearned once again on 9-11, that for your enemy, there is no act of violence so destructive, no betrayal so infamous, no violation of human decency so gross that your enemy will renounce it. There is no lie so heinous, they will not tell it. There is no oath so sacred, they will not break it. There is no target they will spare. There is no instrument of war they will deny themselves. And some of your enemies will knowingly sacrifice their own lives on the altar of their beliefs just to do you harm. Because you are, to your enemy, an enemy. There is one kind of armor, and one kind only that I know of, that will give you any level of protection from your enemy. And that armor is this. Know with certainty you have enemies. The people in this video live the 9-11 experience in an intensely personal way. These people bear witness to the unforgiving nature and bitter fruits of terrorist warfare conducted by a determined enemy. They describe what they experienced, how they felt, what they saw, and the remarks give you a small window into the experience that they will now carry within themselves forever. I appreciate and applaud their willingness to share that experience with us.
9-11 became uh, a very gorgeous uh, sunny day with not a cloud in the sky and it was quite a quite a beautiful September day and I recall driving down the West Side Highway the uh, the, the, the stark difference between how blue the sky was and the plume of smoke and fire coming out of the Trade Center, uh, it, it, you, you start to think this wasn't an accident, there's no way this could have been an accident with no clouds in the sky and being so beautiful and the Trade Center sitting there so crystal clear. So I definitely remember the juxtaposition of the, uh, the flame and the, and the cloud versus the, the bright blue skies on a, on a beautiful morning. I'm what's called a senior inspector with the U.S. Marshal Service, uh, currently acting as an instructor with our training division, and further I'm on loan to Fletzi as a detailed instructor to tactics. Uh, back September 11, 2001, I was a new member of the U.S. Marshal's Warrant Squad. So I recall being uh, at breakfast in, in Harlem at a place called Floridita, eating a, a lovely Spanish breakfast, and that's the time when the TV in the restaurant, which had the sound off, uh, showed a plane uh, that had crashed into the Trade Center. Uh, at the time, all of us thought it was pretty much just like some uh, Cessna, some small plane or whatever, but then the TV showed a second plane slam into it, so we, uh, we all realized this was something insane going on. Uh, cell phones were pretty uh, non-existent back then, for the, for the government anyway, but two or three of us had cell phones and beepers. So. Uh, those cell phones were going off and they were calling the office and the word was get downtown ASAP. So I remember distinctly, no one talked, no one said anything. We just threw money on top of the table and ran for our cars and proceeded to race down what's called the West Side Highway in Manhattan. And going as fast as we possibly could down uh, through rush hour traffic. Uh, at some point, the West Side Highway kind of curves to the left and you get a, a commanding view of downtown Manhattan. And that was the first time we, I clearly saw the Trade Center, which I'd always seen and always takes your breath away, but this time it had a giant fireball it's like shooting out of it and a lot of black, uh, black smoke. So at that point, we realized something was uh, seriously, seriously wrong, like World War III wrong. We turned around and came outside and right away saw a bunch of our colleagues, uh, other task force officers, and they said, the tower has collapsed. I'm like, what do you mean it collapsed? They said, the tower, tower, the tower collapsed. What? And I just remember thinking like, what do you mean collapsed? Uh, we, I would think if something would have happened, a chunk of the building would have fallen off or would have cracked. Uh, you couldn't conceptualize that it would collapse. So we heard the tower collapsed and uh, we actually missed the sound of it all because we were inside 26 Fed. But as we proceeded on to our other office, the federal courthouse, down at 500, 500 Pearl Street, that's when we started to see a stream of, uh, I call them like the white zombies. They were just like people that were obviously within a block or so of the uh, debris field. When the tower collapsed, the debris just toppled over and caked everyone who was in that path with uh, this white powder. And they started to just wander up the, up the streets, away from the Trade Center, just heading north. Arriving at the, what we now call the, the pile or ground zero for the first time was uh, really, really stunk because it was, uh, you could tell right away by looking at it that there were no survivors. I mean, the thing had so completely uh, flattened, uh, it was pretty evident there was gonna be a recovery, not a rescue operation. And that was particularly disturbing because as a lifelong New Yorker, I knew probably several dozen people that worked in the Trade Center in the downtown Manhattan area. So my first thought at seeing the pile was how many people do I know that are underneath this, this wreckage? So it definitely you know, took me aback. The, the firefighters have like a, a duress alarm. It's a high pitched squeal. And you could faintly hear the, the squeals from like some of the, uh, the duress alarm from firefighters, which was, I didn't know at the time what it was, but once I knew what that was, it was kind of very disturbing to know that that's a spot where possibly a firefighter was. What I remember most about the feeling on 9-11 and the days surrounding it was how unified as a country we were. Uh, it didn't make a difference what, what party you were, what race you were, ethnicity, if you were a cop or a banker or whatever, but like, the bond between all Americans was just so so visceral and so real. Everyone just really was unified. I just remember such an overwhelming spirit of being an American that transcended any other uh, 
divisions. So 20 years ago, um, I, I was living in Edison, New Jersey. Uh, for the people that live in New Jersey, exit 10 off of the New Jersey Turnpike. That's what everyone always says, what exit were you on? And so I would obviously have to drive in to work every day because I was a special agent with the United States Secret Service and our office was located in Seven World Trade Center. So I would have a G-Ride and I would drive to and from work every day. It was required. And um, so that day I remember very plainly, a day a lot like today, sunny day, very nice, pretty day. I left home my usual time, I'd say around 7.30 that morning, you know, kissed my wife goodbye and, um, you know, told her I'd see her later. And um, that's the expectation we all have when we, when we leave for a day's work. Arrived somewhere around the neighborhood of, I guess, 8.30. And um, we had several parking spaces that were allocated to the Secret Service under World Trade Center 1. And so I parked in one of those spots and took the elevator up in the Trade Center. And uh, then walked across uh, what we would call the plaza area to my office over in Building 7. And uh, we were up on the 10th floor. And so I had taken my seat at my desk and um, probably had only been sitting there for just a few minutes when really and truly the worst explosion I've ever heard in my life occurred. And it literally felt as if the foundation of the, of the building had been shaken and the entire wall beside us was all glass so I just immediately looked to my right and I could see that um, the North Tower was in a blaze. You know, being a Secret Service agent, our natural instinct to recover and uh, to cover and evacuate kicked in. So we didn't wait for any message to come across for us to stay put or evacuate the building. We began evacuating immediately, um, obviously taking the stairwell down. Well, once we got outside, you know, there were people everywhere. There were people screaming. There were people with just an entire look of terror on their face. You could tell a lot of them were in shock. There were a lot of people that were injured. Um, and, and so we were trying as best we could to try and direct people to safety and help people to get out. But um, just mass chaos everywhere you would look. So it took some time. We were, we were not really certain again that it was a bomb. We didn't know what it was. But then a short time later, when the second plane came in and hit the other tower, then there was no question in my mind that we were under attack. Well, as I, I think I've said, we were the largest field office for the Secret Service. So we had a lot of people uh, in the New York office and we had a lot of people that were unaccounted for. And so that was our motivation to go back is to try and find our colleagues and see if they needed assistance in getting out. I didn't know what to expect. Um, I knew it was gonna be bad. Um, but, but I didn't know how bad. As we got back in the general vicinity of the North Tower, before we could really even you know, make any progress with what we had returned to do, the, the South Tower started to, to, to fall. Uh, it collapsed first because it was struck at a much lower impact than was the North Tower. So as soon as the South Tower started to fall, you know, that just complicated matters even more that we were not able to do what we had intended to do and we had to then evacuate the area for our own safety. You know, fortunately, I was able to get back to um, an area quite a bit north of there. It was actually an outdoor ball field, and we were attempting to, to try and finally make communications with our family. A lot of people don't realize this, but Verizon had their, their tower, their switching uh, tower was located there in the North Tower, and, uh, and I think the repeater antennas were up on top of it. So that was all knocked out. So the communications as far as using the cellular service was just about impossible. I was actually able to reach my parents who lived in South Carolina at the time before I was able to reach my wife who was across the river in New Jersey. And so they relayed the message back to her before I was able to, to actually communicate with her that I was alive and okay. I think the worst thing that comes to my mind is, is while out on that ball field and looking back at the towers, I saw you know, several people leap to their death from over 80 stories high. And, and the thing that impacted me more than anything else is just the thought of that personal decision to know that you're jumping to your death and that that's the best alternative as opposed to what faces behind you, that inferno that was ensuing. So, you know, just what a, what a horrible decision that those people had to make on that day. Mm -hmm. 
You know, as time elapses, you know, I've got 18-year-old twin daughters, and the only thing they know about 9-11, they were not alive. The only thing they know is what they hear dad say and what they see on the news. So if dad's not willing to talk about it anymore, you know, the more time elapses, the less you hear about it on the news, the less our new generations know about it. So, you know, I think it's, it's absolutely critical that we don't let complacency set in. We don't let our guard down. I think the creation of our department, Department of Homeland Security, didn't exist prior. Um, the creation of it has certainly moved us uh, forward, great leaps in making sure that our nation is prepared, that we don't ever have to deal with a situation like this again, and God forbid that we do have another major situation, that we're able to more quickly and efficiently respond to it. I woke up that morning, uh, left the house. I had a government car at the time, it was an old beater because I was a brand new agent. Had a 1993 Oldsmobile Cutlass Calais, brown, with uh, 178,000 miles on it and no air conditioning. So uh, the fact that it was such a perfect day actually worked out for me because I was able to drive in with the windows down. Uh, and I remember not a cloud in the sky. It was just truly a beautiful day. And uh, my boss called me when I was just north of, I believe, the Williamsburg Bridge to tell me that a plane had hit the World Trade Center. Um, I couldn't see the towers from where I was because of other skyscrapers that were between me and the buildings. But as I made a little bit further down the FDR Drive, I was able to see Ground Zero, and I was able to see that one of the planes, uh, rather one of the towers, the North Tower, um, had some damage to it and there was smoke coming out of it. But at that point, I still couldn't tell the, the gravity of the situation. So I, I quickly got across Manhattan, driving west, uh, was able to head south on, um, on Greenwich Street, which uh, feeds into the World Trade Center site. Uh, and for the first time in a long time, I was actually able to find a parking spot right away. And I remember as I parked the car, um, somewhat like what happens when you get a little too close to an intersection when you're driving, you gotta kinda lean forward to look up at the light. Well, I remember having to lean forward to look up at the building, and uh, I saw that there were people uh, both, um, you know, very close to and, and shortly above the impact site, um, leaning out the windows, waving um, white cloths or whatever they had to try to get attention for people that were down on the ground. So uh, at this point, I, I got out of my car, walked a little bit north on Greenwich Street to the next intersection, which is called Vesey Street. I made a left and uh, started walking towards, I know there's a stairwell that leads up to the World Trade Center's plaza, as they call it. And I remember that's when I saw a plane engine on the ground, right on the corner, uh, completely detached from the plane, and it was massive. And it was at that point uh, that I realized that we were dealing with a commercial airliner. I mean, the, the, the damage to the building was significant, but it still at that point never dawned on me just what we were dealing with. And at that point, I was shocked to see, wow, this is a commercial airliner that hit the building. Um, then I ran into a, co a colleague of mine, John Faust, a detective. Uh, he had a police radio, which was useful. Um, and he had a plan, and it was a good plan at the time. And it's, we're going to stick together. So we went up to the plaza, which it wasn't street level. Like I said, it was one story up. And did the same thing we were doing down below, which was to try to keep people moving. Um, because... You know, obviously it's a, it's a scene, the firemen had to get in there, all the rescue workers, and there was still stuff occasionally falling. So we just tried to keep people moving. Um, and while we were up there, that's when the second plane hit. Um, at that time, I remember, you know, uh, just feeling the heat of the plane come through the building because there was a fireball. Um, it was, even though it was many, many stories up, you felt the heat, and I remember hearing the sound, it was deafening. And it was at that point that I noticed, you know, I mean, there was a lot of paper that was falling from the, uh, the, the impact of the plane. And, and um, obviously one of the things we were concerned about is debris falling, so you would constantly look up. And I remember one time looking up and seeing a, a, a person had, had jumped from the building. I never saw somebody actually jump, so it was actually a horrifying thing to see and a horrifying thing to hear because it made a horrible noise. And I remember just trying to process, like, how bad can it be up there? Like, what's going on? Why are these people now all of a sudden starting to jump? Like, I didn't, was, it, was it the heat? Is it getting too hot? Is it that they've given up hope? I remember trying to process what, what, what was leading to them to do that. And it, it, it gave this horrible feeling of helplessness. But at the same time, you know, people jumping now and other debris fall. And I realized this isn't a safe place to be. Um, so we left. And at this point, I looked across the street back towards uh, the towers, and I saw a bunch of NYPD cops that I uh, were walking into the plaza, and I knew three of them. Three of them I knew very well. Vinnie Dans, John Coughlin, and Walter Weaver. 
Um, they were emergency service cops, and I watched them walk into the site. And um, it was, as I was fixated on them, for some reason I was staring, I wasn't really paying attention um, to what was going on around me. And Jason Zamaloff, the agent I spoke about earlier, grabbed my shoulder with like force. And he only said one, one word, run. And I remember looking up and um, from where we were standing, if you ever see the footage of the towers, when, it, when the South Tower fell, it, it, it looked like it was falling like a domino towards the east side. But what happened was the top of the building canted as it collapsed down, but from where I was standing, it looked like it was falling. Uh, eventually it collapsed um, more downward, but uh, I did what Jason said, I ran. I ran as fast as I could north on Church Street, and uh, I remember thinking, I gotta get cover, and there were some parked cars, and there was a fire truck. Uh, I decided that I would fit better under the fire truck. So I, I went under this fire truck that was parked between the two towers, and um, tried to take cover there, and I remember the fire truck was shaking, the ground was shaking, and things were hitting the fire truck, and then all of a sudden the dust cloud blew through. And it was weird because that cloud wasn't just like a fine dust, it was like a thick uh, particulate sort of material. So when it got my eyes, to, to blink my eyes hurt, like it felt like sandpaper. And um, it also became difficult to breathe. And I don't know how long I was under that truck, it felt like 30 seconds, 40 seconds, it could have been less, it could have been a lot less. But I came to this realization like, hey stupid, you're gonna die here, you're gonna suffocate. So I rolled out from under the truck and started to run north as best I could without being able to see very well. And I had met up with our other assistant special agent in charge, not the one I met earlier. But uh, so I was talking to Bill, the other ASAC, when the North Tower collapsed. And uh, we, we ran into a store and, and, and sought you know, um, shelter from the, the debris and from the dust cloud. I wasn't as close to the North Tower as I was the South Tower, so I wasn't as fearful that I would get injured. Um, and then after the dust settled again, we came out and tried to look for survivors, see if we could help anybody, but it was the same scenario. Either people were able to get out of that area um, or, or they perished. It's easy to focus on the horrible things that, that I saw. It's easy to let those thoughts take over. Unless you also think of the amazing heroism that you saw that day. I mean, we were all covered in dust. We were all ashen gray. Nobody cared what your politics were, what agency you were with, whether you were Hispanic or white or black, or none of that mattered. We came together on the, the, the second half of 9-11. I say 9-12. Um, we were one. We, we functioned together. There was a sense of pride in, in being Americans, realizing that we had a lot more in common than we have differently. Uh, I, I have this thing I, I say all the time, let's live every day like it's 9-12. Um, so I mean, that, that heroism, that togetherness I saw uh, is, what I like to remember. It looked like a clear day from what I could tell. The temperature was, it was nice. Uh, uh, the sky was clear. Didn't look like it was gonna rain or feel that way at all. I'm uh, site director of uh, Fletzi's uh, Training Point in Cheltenham, Maryland. I was a director of operations for the 33rd Field Investigation Squadron, which was part of the Air Force Office of Special Investigations and it was uh, on Andrews Air Force Base in Maryland. I was sitting at my desk and there was a little bit of commotion out in the hallway and, and one of the guys uh, yelled and said, hey boss, uh, you need to come see this. And they had a uh, TV set up in one of the other offices and uh, walked over there and was watching the TV and they were replaying uh, the first crash into the World uh, Trade Center towers. And it would, you know, they're just repeating it and repeating it. Uh, and then every now and then they'd go to a live shot. You could see basically a smoking hole. And as we were watching, I was trying to figure out what in the world happened, you know, trying to make sense of this crash and thinking, gosh, you know, could it have been a mechanical problem? Could it have been a an air traffic control, what in the world, how could it have happened? And as we were walking, watching this smoking hole in the building, we saw live another, a second plane crash into the other uh, tower of the World Trade Center there. And then it was like, I just couldn't comprehend it. I didn't really understand what was going on. But when the second plane hit, then we started to think, okay, this was not a mechanical area. This was not an air traffic control situation. This, this had to be 
had to be on purpose. And then the uh, phone rang uh, and I went over, picked it up and he said, hey, we have uh, uh, what we believe was a bomb that exploded at the Pentagon. And that's how I received notification of the attack on the Pentagon. And then we said, okay, it's time. We need to get people over there. We need to get folks over there to assist to find out what's going on. And I had, at that time, I had some uh, forensic scientists uh, who immediately deployed to go over there to try and figure out you know, what in the world is going on. Uh, and then when we realized how serious it was, how significant uh, a hole in the Pentagon there was, how much damage, uh, we just started working. And we went to work and we worked for, for months without a day off, a uh, you know, 12 hour shift, just unbelievable amount of work and effort. I didn't get to go over to the Pentagon myself right away. It was quite a while. So I, I wanted to know what was going on and I wanted to get it a firsthand account. Uh, and so when the bus is loaded up, I like to be there, uh, you know, to, to just say, hey, uh, just check on them and make sure people were okay and, and they were ready for it. We just didn't know what to expect, what we were going into. And I remember one of the forensic scientists who was on the bus getting ready to go uh, had, had called me over and said, hey, we've got a, an agent here who's got uh, some serious asthma condition and I can't get him off the bus. He, he won't get off the bus. He wants to go over to the Pentagon. And the environment they were in at that time, very dusty, very dirty, just sifting through the what we call the rock pile is where when they did some of their immediate stuff, they just piled up a bunch of debris. And eventually we had to go over there and go through it piece by piece looking for any evidence or clues, things that, you know, try to help us figure out what had happened. And... The forensic scientist said, you know, this, this guy really shouldn't go. This, this will hurt him if he's with the asthma. And so I had to call him off the bus and I explained to him, I said, look, it, you know, I appreciate your dedication. I genuinely do. But you, this, is, this is your health we're talking about. And I literally had to order him off the bus and not to go because he wanted in the fight. Uh, he wanted to be a part of that. And I think he's still mad at me to this day uh, because I wouldn't let him uh, get back on the bus. The hole in the Pentagon, the size of the hole that that uh, aircraft made as it crashed into the Pentagon and very little remains of the plane were left. I mean, it had thousands of gallons of avgas on it when it crashed in and it was just a fireball in there, burned everything to a crisp in there. And then the fire departments came and put out the fire. So they mixed all that with water. And just look, it was just, a, and at that time it was pretty, it was cleaned up a much, much better than it was initially. But I just couldn't get over the size of the hole in that building. And I couldn't get over that. You couldn't tell what had happened. I mean, by just looking, I mean, there was no tail of the plane sticking out. There was nothing that you that I could look at and focus at and say, yep. Uh, but as they dug into it, and it became apparent what it was, but I was just in awe of just how much damage there was done to that building. I hope that we don't minimize what happened. Okay, We were attacked. People tried to kill us, and I did kill a lot of us. And my concern is, as we get farther from that, and gets farther from our memory and the folks who never experienced can't or won't appreciate it. And then when you have people who are trying to make light of it, oh, it's no big deal. That was a tremendous deal. And I hope we don't forget that. And I hope as parents or grandparents that we take the time to tell our kids about it. You know, when we, on 9-11, you know, just take a few minutes and sit down tell them where they were when it happened. Tell them what they were going through, what they thought and what they felt. Don't let them forget it. We have an obligation as parents and grandparents to pass it on exactly what we did, what happened, how we felt and how we responded rather than make light of it and try to forget it. Because then we haven't learned the lesson.
In the years after the attacks of September 11, 2001, our nation erected monuments and memorials to honor the memories of the heroes and victims of that terrible day. Here at the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center's headquarters at Glencoe, Georgia, we too have a memorial to honor and never forget. Incorporated into Fletzi's memorial is a piece of the World Trade Center Towers. This I-beam was cut from the twisted remains of the Twin Towers, and it represents our history of 9-11, while the monument itself represents our future and serves as a constant reminder to never forget. The beam, which is the centerpiece, is shielded by white marble stands, nine on the left side of the beam and 11 on the right side. Together, they mark the date 9-11. The base of the memorial is 110 inches wide, representing the 110 stories of the World Trade Center towers. The steps of the base begin with broken concrete and are refined in materials until they end at the top in polished granite. Each step is 17 and a half inches wide in remembrance of Flight 175. And there are three nine inch risers etched with words starting at the bottom in memory of Flight 93. The bottom riser is inscribed with the word service. The middle riser has the word country and the top riser has the word family. The riser surrounding the base is inscribed with the word courage in respect for the courageous men and women who protect our nation every day. The events of 9-11 changed us as a nation forever. This monument represents our unyielding American spirit and resolve to never forget our past as we continue to move forward towards our greater future. 2,977 people were killed in the attacks on September 11, 2001. 343 were New York City firefighters. 71 were New York City and other New York and New Jersey law enforcement officers. One U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service officer died in the crash of United Flight 93 just outside of Shanksville, Pennsylvania. Since that day, 20 years ago, more than 1,500 additional people have died of various illnesses and more than 23,000 people are living with cancer and other illness brought on by their exposure to the debris of 9-11. Fletzi and our partner agencies had many people respond to Ground Zero respond to the Pentagon and respond to Shanksville, Pennsylvania in heroic fashion. Those people worked for days, weeks, and even months on end by joining the rescue and then later the recovery efforts that were underway. Some of them are now among the fallen and many of them are living with illnesses brought on by their heroic efforts. Just inside Fletzi Glencoe's main gate stands Building 912, named in honor of heroes and victims of 9-11. It recalls our nation's pride and unity on September 12, 2001, 912. Building 912 is home to our 9-11 Memorial and to Fletzi Graduates Memorial. On the Graduates Memorial are the names of 263 fallen agents and officers who since 1970 graduated a Fletzi basic training program and then later died in the line of duty. Among these 263 names are the names of federal officers and agents who died Responding to 9-11, agents and officers that died in both Iraq and Afghanistan, and those heroes that have since fallen to their illness from their incredible work and in response to the cowardly attacks on that clear September Tuesday morning 20 years ago.